Welcome to the NDIS Property Australia podcast. Before starting this episode, we need to provide a general disclaimer. Information contained in this podcast is general in nature only. It does not take into account the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. You need to consider your financial situation and needs before making any decisions based on the information in this podcast. And you should consider seeking independent and professional advice for your personal circumstances. All right, let's begin. Welcome back to another episode of the NDIS Property Australia podcast. Today we're here with Emilita and Dante, and we're talking about SDA funding for participants. Take it away, Em. Thank you so much. So today we're here with Dante from Adapt Housing. So Dante, do you want to introduce yourself and let us know what your role is at Adapt, what you do, what you guys are all about? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emilita. And, um, you know, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. I suppose a little bit about Adapt Housing. So we're an STA provider. So we're based here in Brisbane and my role is uh, investor relations. So I work closely with investors uh, as well as though talking I suppose support coordinators and participants to help find a suitable housing solution, uh, and that you know coincides one another between the investors and the participants to ensure that we can come to a you know a suitable arrangement for all parties. Mm-hmm. Great. All right. Thank you for that. And I think today, we'll, what we'll talk about today is we'll talk about funding and how participants get their funding because I think that is a really important conversation to have for you know, maybe future participants uh, of the NDIS SDA scheme, but also for the, for the investors and other peers in the NDIS community to actually understand the process of how this works. So yeah, maybe we can start with you talking to us, talking us through the process of how a participant acquires their funding. Yeah, of course. So it, it's a long process to get SDA in their plan. So initially, for a participant to be eligible for SDA, they need to be a part of the NDIS, so the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I suppose. So that's that's the first step and that's the biggest thing. From there, what they need is a, an OT or an occupational therapist to do a, a, a comprehensive assessment to determine the eligibility for SDA. So to be eligible for SDA, one of the biggest rules is uh, you need six or more interventions a day, as well as be deemed as having high needs. So an intervention could be something as simple as uh, needing help getting dressed, cooking dinner, help going to the toilet. So you'll see six can can add up really, really quickly. But along with that OT report, it, it coincides with what we call a housing assessment report. So this is done by the likes of people such as Simone Burley, uh, Greg Barry and Robert Northcott. They're three that um, are, are really big in this space and do really, really uh, in-depth and efficient sort of person. All this documentation along with other bits and pieces is submitted to the NDIA for um, for the consideration and the application of NDF SDA in their plans, but this this can take six to nine months, so it is quite a long process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. I think um, a lot of people don't actually know what SDA is, and they don't actually know that it's something that's different from the overall NDIS scheme. So, yeah, maybe we could just clarify what is SDA and how is it different. Like, what's the difference between somebody who just has NDIS funding and has SDA funding? Yeah, so I suppose SDA being that special line item in an NDIS plan. So SDA um, is the accommodation, so specialist disability accommodation for those who need specialised housing solutions. And these are people across the four categories, obviously, as probably mentioned earlier, is improved livability, fully accessible, high physical support and robust. And, you know, this specialised housing is to assist with the delivery of supports for those with, I suppose, the two being extreme functional impairment impairment or very high support needs. So only about 6% of participants who have NDIS funding are actually eligible for SDA. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks so much for clarifying that. So you mentioned that it is a bit of a process to get this SDA funding that, you know, they firstly have to be approved for the NDIS, which can take, you know, maybe up to three months and then the SDA approval process can take did you say six to nine months is that what you said yeah it can vary case by case you know we've heard of cases or you know taking longer we've heard of others that are done within days if not weeks it's really a case by case based on the complexity of it Uh uh-huh yeah okay and what what gets taken into consideration during this process what issues may they run into 
Uh, so I suppose it, it's a difficult one in the sense that uh, participants have to identify goals. You know, the, the biggest driving force behind getting SDA is what their goals are and what they wish to achieve out of ha- having SDA in their plan. So, you know, for a lot of people, getting SDA means it gives them the ability to move out of their parents' home and live a bit more independently or, you know, they've got a family and they're in um, unsuitable accommodation. You know, they might be in a department of housing or they might be in just a regular rental and, you know, the participant in in, in conversation is actually, you know, wheelchair-bound and the property they're in, it's got, it's got steps and there's gradients and it's just, it's unsuitable. So we hear a lot of stories of participants looking for properties and going through the SDA process just in trying to find accommodation and a forever home that's suitable to them and their needs. So it, it's quite complex and we've heard stories of participants being knocked back of the appropriate funding. You know, mm-hmm. they've been funded to share rather than independent funding uh, because that's what the NDIS deem. And it's it's quite critical that housing report um, that's done by mm-hmm. an SDA uh, report writer you know, these reports should be anywhere between 90 to 100 pages, really. Uh, and, and we see those and they're in-depth and they're they're very good in um, justifying the goals and the needs of these participants. But then we've seen others that don't, aren't quite as sufficient in evidence to support and they're the ones that we're seeing that unfortunately just aren't getting that correct funding amount. However, mm-hmm. this doesn't prevent them from getting that. You know, there's, there's avenues such as NS100 or the AAT, which is an independent uh, organization that allows these participants to fight and appeal their funding amount to get what they deem is the appropriate funding amount because the mm-hmm. scheme and the NDIS and the SDA it's all about choice and control mm-hmm. yeah. so these participants want to be able to um, integrate in society, in society and live a wholesome life but to do so they need that choice and control so it, it's complex yeah yeah so so what I'm hearing is that there's this housing report that uh, gets done and that can really impact this whole process of applying for this SDA funding. And um, you mentioned that if if they do get, for lack of a better word, knocked back or perhaps they don't get the level of funding that they want, they have options. Like, is that like, is that the tribunal, those, those options that you mentioned, those independent options, Dante? Yeah, so there's different avenues, and I suppose one of the biggest, one of the most prominent at the moment is the tribunal. Where participants are, you know, being given their funding amount. You know, it might be a shared funding, one to three, and in this scenario, that it could be a father who has a wife and two children, a dog, and the NDIA have turned around. And said, well, no, we're only going to fund you to live in a shared house with two other strangers you've never met. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're the kind of stories that you hear of and these participants are the ones that are going back and fighting that and you know saying well listen this is my situation this is this is what i wanted and this is what you give me how is this choice and control so there has been a lot of pushback but you know those those who really persevere and stick at it are getting the outcome that they wish but again not only is it six to nine months to get sda in your plans but for these participants who are going back and appealing their funding it's taking upwards of 12 months on top of that. So it, wow. it is really, really strenuous on, wow. on these participants and it, it's awful to think about and that's why we say those who persevere do get the outcome, mm-hmm. but it's just to have that drive and the energy to be able to stick it out for such long periods of time. It, it's hard. Yes. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I've got chills as you're saying that now actually. And look, um, this is for those listening, this is part one of a two-part uh, podcast and Dante and I will be going deeper into a case study that actually goes through that that process of um, a participant acquiring funding that wasn't appropriate for them. So more on that in the next episode. So thank you for that, Dante. Now, for those who don't know, how does the funding actually work? Can you give an example or explain, um, you know, the different options that somebody might go through like I know I know that there's a chart with different um, SDA funding outcomes can you shed light to that give us an example just just so just to give people yeah. an idea <laughs> yeah yeah of course so I suppose you know in a way you look at it uh, that price guide you talk about so it's it's basically it, it outlines based on the different funding funding amounts that a participant could be approved for mm-hmm. so on that there are 84 different combinations Wow. So out of there, um, if I just pull one out of the 84, you'll have someone who's funded for high physical support to live house to residents. So pretty much stating that you're being funded, you're, you're deemed high physical support. Mm-hmm. So you're most likely to be someone who's 
reliant upon a wheelchair or uh, it's a degenerative condition like MS, so you'll require uh, automated technology, uh, ceiling hoists. So that's someone who's deemed high physical support. And but you're being told that you have to live in a house with two, oh, sorry, hey, live in a house with yourself and someone else. So that funding amount, for example, is forty four thousand nine hundred ninety two. So that's the annual income for that funding item or line item mm-hmm. with OA. So OA is on-site overnight accommodation, which is it, it's an additional room that is where a carer or the supports will most likely set up an office and live. So it's that in-house care that the participants might need because, mm-hmm. as mentioned, you know, to be eligible for SDA, you need that high level of care and needs. So a bit extra funding is given from an OA. The difference between them, it varies because there's two line items per uh, design category, one's with OLA funding and one's without. Um, so, you know, this sort of, sort of stuff we could go on and get right down the nitty gritty for the next <laughs> hour or two, which, you know, I'll, I'll keep it brief at, at a top level. But, yeah, the funding guide's definitely, it's, it's almost a whole other conversation how it works. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, I suppose, an example of um, one of the line items. But it then goes into a, a coinciding location factor price guide, which works in hand with it. So. You build a house for two residents that are for high physical support participants in, let's just say, you know, South Brisbane sort of region. Mm-hmm. So from there, there's another another table, another chart that outlines uh, a location factor, mm-hmm. and that location factor takes in takes into consideration what the funding amount and adjusts it based on that location factor. So just trying to have a look here, you know, South Brisbane, as mentioned. For a house two residents, it's got a location factor of 0.98, which means you're pretty much that, that 44,000 I mentioned earlier is multiplied by that 0.98. And that's your true mm-hmm. annual SDA value of income on a gross level. Yeah. So what you're saying is there's a certain amount that people get um, approved for based off this application process. And then there is a location factor that's applied for wherever the person chooses to live, wherever there's suitable accommodation for them there. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, so the the thing is that even though let's say um, the data says that there is, I don't know, X amount of fully accessible participants living in a certain area, those fully accessible participants are going to have a different level of funding based off what their SDA, uh, what they were were approved for for SDA, right? So, So there's more to it than just, okay, there's there's, I don't know, 10 participants in, I'm just making up things right now, South Brisbane, because that was the example you use. There's 10 participants in South Brisbane that are of a fully accessible category. I'm just making up figures just for the example. And um, those participants, those 10 participants could have any any of those options. So they might be approved for- yeah, any um, of the 84. Yeah. Any of the 84. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so there is a lot more that goes into it. So I think- um, let, let's let's talk about an example. So let's say I am an investor and I've just purchased a, a one-bedroom apartment, okay? Uh, let's say a one-bedroom high physical support uh, built apartment. Now, there's a common misconception that that means that a person will get, or the, sorry, if a high physical support person moves in, that automatically they would get the the figure on that price guide that states one bedroom apartment. So did you want to shed some light to that? Sure. So I suppose there's a few different elements to consider when looking at that. So say you've bought an off the plan one bedroom apartment in a multi-residential high rise apartment. You know, it's in a great location. Let's say it's, you know, wool and gabba. However, what you've got to consider is so you've you've paid the money, you've retrofitted it to meet high physical support standards. That's great. You've also got to consider that in order to be eligible for that OA funding amount, which is the higher of the two line items between the with and without, you actually need a second apartment to be um, able to claim that OA funding. So in a house, it can be an additional room within. However, in an apartment, it has to be an additional apartment. So it works on what they call a concierge model. So regardless if it's one part, one apartment being serviced or if it's 10, an additional apartment needs to be designated for the OOA. So all of a sudden, you purchasing one unit, that's great. You, you can still claim your SDA funds, but it's significantly less than, I suppose, what you may perceive. So that's that's one, I suppose, of the elements to consider. The other is you may not actually get necessarily that highest funded participant. So 
when when registered, the dwelling is registered for one amount. So it's registered for what it's been built to. However, you can apply still all other 83 funding amounts to that unit. So that's where you can use the price guide quite flexibly. So let's just say that one bedroom's funded or so has an SDA value of 91,000 before location factor. That's that's just the value that it's being registered as. We can then use the price guide and go, all right, this participant actually has 69,000, who is a, which is fully accessible for a one bedroom apartment. And that's where we can talk with investors and we can, I suppose, in a way, negotiate or come to come to terms that uh, that they can be accepted that participant on that level of funding it doesn't have to be just that highest funding amount you know we can be flexible and so can the investor as to who we accept in in that dwelling it doesn't have to be that exact amount that it's registered for and that's what we're finding nationally on average it's about 1.4 participants per dwelling moving in and the average funding amount I would say not using data would be around that 41 to 60 mark at the moment is where we're sort of seeing the funding amounts coming through. Not a lot of one-to-ones. Um, again, on part two, I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into a bit deeper with, with what's just happened um, mm-hmm. in yeah, terms of sure. a, a, a turnaround. But at the moment, yeah, it's not a lot of one-to-one funding has been approved, which, you know, it it's sad. And these participants, there's a lot going through the process of fighting that. Um, but the current market conditions, that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there's so much to go into with, um, you know, the participant funding and then also from the investor perspective, um, what they, what they can expect if they, if they purchase, you know, any sort of investment property, what the potential is. And yeah, it's, it's always worth a conversation around. Yeah. It's, it's always worth a conversation. We're just, we're just scraping the surface, um, in this particular conversation. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much so much more. Um suppose there's there's a couple more questions um that I come up like uh, that come up in conversation. So around funding, around participants, um etc. So one of the one of the things that um some some investors have said to me is um you know who gets to choose who actually lives in the property? How does that process work? Do you choose it? Does the NDIS choose it? Do the investors choose it? Who chooses who actually moves into a property? Yeah, good question. So there's a lot of parties involved in the SDA that you'll come to realize very quickly, you know, as we touched on earlier, not just your report writer and your occupational therapist. There's also what we call support coordinators, plan managers, SIL providers, SIL standing for supported independent living. So they're the ones that provide the day-to-day care. Um, You've got public guardians. You've got... um, family members, you've got obviously your SDA provider. There, there is so many different parties involved in in this space and this process of moving participants into their forever home. But when it comes down to the funding amount, so the NDIA, the only role they really play in it is they allocate a funding amount and say, here is your SDA funding amount. You know, let's just say high physical sport with OOA, house to residents to live in South Brisbane. And that'll be a, a value of Again, pulling the number out of 42,000 or so. With that 42,000 now, the participants told to go find accommodation that's best suited to them with that funding amount. Obviously, it's quite low and you know, that, that funding amount, they've, they've indicated that that's to be used in a house setting with two or three other residents. Uh, however, where we can get flexible is you know, a participant might approach an SDA provider like ADAPT and say, hey, I've been funded for this amount. I would really love to live in South Brisbane. You know, that's where all my um, allied health services are. It's where my family is, all that. Have you got anything available? And let's just say there's a small villa development being undertaken in South Brisbane. And we go to the investor and say, hey, I understand that you're building this four pack of villas uh, that are for an SDA value of 55,000. However, we've got a participant who's got 43, 42,000. Are you happy to accept them? So we always have that conversation with an investor prior to, we always approach the investor with the participant's funding amount just to ensure that, you know, they're happy with them to move in on that amount and the participant's happy to live there. So it's all about transparency between all the parties to ensure that everyone's kept happy. Unfortunately, there are some hard conversations where a participant with 41 might want to live in this apartment that's got a value of, you know, 70 or 80,000. And, and sometimes it doesn't work out well. It's really, really hard to have those conversations, but mm-hmm. it's just all yeah. about that openness and transparency between all the parties to come to an agreement. So 
pretty much in short answer, we don't decide. It is end of the day up to the investor as to mm-hmm. whether or not they're happy for them to live in live in their property. Yeah. Understood. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Well, is there anything else that you could think of? Any last parting words of wisdom? Not really. I suppose, as you said, we've really just touched on the surface and we're always open to, to have these conversations uh, with investors if they have any further clarifying comments or questions they might might need from a SDA provider. I'm more than happy to run through it with them because I know obviously it, it's a lot to think about. Um, it's a lot to get your head around. So, so we're always more than happy to answer any questions that may be. Yeah, I suppose that's that's all I've really got yeah. from from my end. Great. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions that have just popped into your head. I mean, not yet, but I know that we are doing episode two, which is going to be a case study on, yeah, funding outcomes. So the application process outcomes and then going through that tribunal process of, um, you know, appealing uh, for, for more for a different funding amount. So we'll go into that in the next episode, which I'm really, really looking forward to. But yeah, I, I think that this has been really helpful information, Dante. And Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. I know that this is going to be um, a really insightful and beneficial conversation for investors and participants that want to apply for the SDA to listen to. So thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Like I said, I look forward to the second one. Great. Thanks, Dante. Thanks, Emily. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please make sure that you are subscribed and following us so that you can keep in the loop with all of our upcoming episodes. We would really appreciate it if you could leave us a five-star rating, a written review, and to share this episode with those that can benefit. Until next time, catch you on the next episode.